welcome. Um, I am thrilled to introduce Mark Brackett. Mark is the founding director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and a professor at the Child Study Center, the Yale School of Medicine. Um, and he is also the author of a recent book called Permission to Feel. Um, Mark, thank you so much for being here today. Really looking forward to this. Thank you for having me. And it was lovely to hear my colleagues um, and friends uh, speaking just a minute ago. And I want to just uh, give a shout out to Myra, who I feel very moved by what you said. And I want to give you the permission to have those feelings that you have about what's happening right now, because certainly um, many of us are stressed out about the lives that many of our kids are, are living right now. And we want to do everything we can to support them. So. I'm gonna jump right in. Um, the title of my presentation today, I'm calling it the big seven, healthy emotion regulation during uncertain times. And um, that's my information on the bottom and feel free to share anything with anyone that you'd like. But I'm gonna start off with something I always do, which is just asking people to check in with how they're feeling. How are you feeling after your last group of presentations? This is a tool that's based in science we call the mood meter. And essentially, to keep it brief today, yellow are these high energy pleasant emotions, right? Feeling excited and optimistic and hopeful. The green are the calm content emotions. The blue sound sad, disappointed, maybe a little hopeless or despair. And the red are those high energy feelings that are activating, like the anxiety family and the anger family. So just check in, how are you doing? And what I wanted to share with you was uh, some research that we've done just in the last two weeks. So I'm a proud board member of the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And in that role, what I did was a, uh, a study with 5,000 people across the United States. And I'm gonna share those data with you in one minute. But when we looked back at our educators um, in a study that I did about three years ago, what we found was they were mostly feeling frustrated and overwhelmed and stressed. That's 70% of the feelings that teachers told us they were having each day in their roles as educators were what we might call negative emotions. When we studied students, they were tired and bored and stressed. When we studied people in the traditional workforce, they also were overwhelmed and stressed. And then last week or two weeks ago now, we did this study. And these were 5,000 participants across the globe, actually, who shared how they're feeling right now. And as you can see, um, the words are different. Anxiety blows up as being the number one emotion that people are experiencing, coupled with overwhelmed and frustrated, uncertain and worried. But anxiety really stands out. And sadly, only about 5% of the words that people use to describe how they were feeling each day were what we might call positive emotions. So when we look at that, you know, and we go back to plotting these you know, emotions on this tool, what we see is that we are a world, a nation, a country, a state, a school, a city, a home, you know, that is emotionally out of balance. And we're spending a lot of time right now in that red and blue. And a few things about that. One is it's normal to have these feelings and we don't want to be judges about these emotions. We want to figure out ways to use our feelings wisely. Anxiety is information. It's saying that I'm just seeing the world as being uncertain. Um, Frustration is important, saying my, you know, everybody's blocking my goals to achieving a goal. The problem that we have, I think, uh, are multifold. One is that there's too many books about happiness. And what I mean by that is that we've been programmed, you know, that we have to get rid of our negative feelings and be happy all the time. I don't know about any of you that are on this webinar, but it's really hard for me to be happy right now. I can try to have well-being. Um, but I really, I feel even weird feeling happy at this point in time. I'm concerned. Um, I'm maybe hopeful, um, optimistic that we have really smart people in this country and elsewhere that are working hard to solve these problems. But we can't be happy all the time. And if we make that our goal, I think we're going to feel more negative feelings. So what I'm going to urge you to think about during my webinar and for the rest of your life is not how to get rid of your red and blue feelings and kind of make them all yellow and green, but how to have greater balance in terms of your emotional life. 
Now, when we ask people in our webinar, how are you dealing with your new feelings or your feelings of anxiety and et cetera, what we found was maybe like all of you, they're not regulating very well. Screaming, wine, 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 avoidance, overeating, watching trash TV, um, the list goes on. So let me ask all of you right now, how are you regulating? Really, how are you managing your feelings right now? What kind of thought strategies are you using? Are you ruminating? Are you yelling, screaming, blaming? Are you not getting enough sleep and eating sugary and fatty foods? Are you telling yourself, I don't need to exercise today? How are you dealing with your feelings? Because to me, that's what we have to work on. Going from acceptance to shifting to maybe even doing things that we enjoy to bring some joy in our life. What I want to share briefly about these unhelpful strategies is that, you know, many of us learn them early in life. Um, you know, my mother was a lovely woman, but she was always having a nervous breakdown. So the other night I'm like, oh, I'm having a breakdown. And I'm like, oh shit, just became my mother again. Um, so we learn them early in our life and we oftentimes become those strategies. Um, what's interesting is it requires no effort. Oftentimes they're automatic and happens outside of awareness. They provide, but they do provide immediate relief sometimes, don't they? When you say something like, you know, I can't take you anymore. You know, that yelling and that screaming is cathartic. The problem is that they're harmful to ourselves and other people. They don't solve the problem. They negative impact relationships. They decrease their health and well-being, and they become really bad habits. That brings me to our center's work. Um, so the vision of the Center for Emotional Intelligence is to use the power of emotions to create a healthier and more equitable, innovative and compassionate society. And the reason why I hope you're listening is not because you wanna hear Mark Brackett's opinion, but really because you wanna learn about the science of emotions. And there are five reasons why everyone on this webinar should care about feelings. And it's because A, they are the drivers of our attentional capacity. So if you're bored right now with my presentation, you're already taking notes, you're already texting somebody, you're already doing something that's not about what I'm sharing with you. Think about it. Boredom just says, I'm not engaged and I'm gonna do something that makes me feel engaged. I was a kid who had terrible stress and anxiety. I was abused as a child, I had terrible bullying, and I was a terrible student. Um, so what happened with me was that there was no one attending to my feelings. I was in that fight or flight um, place almost daily. You know, who cares about the Roman oligarchy? Who cares about learning when you're just trying to just survive? The second is decision-making. How we feel influences the choices we make each day. The third is relationship quality. I ask yourself to just pause. If you're at home by yourself or even if you have a big family. When you're walking around your home, when you're at dinner, when you're just being with people, what is your facial expression showing? Are you saying approach or are you saying avoid? Take a moment and think about that. What are the messages that you're sending to the world? Because emotions are signals, right? When we make these kind of disgusted faces or we have the frown or the pressed lips, we're pretty much sending messages like, stay away, I'm not here for you, I don't wanna listen. When we have a more gentle face and a little bit of a serene look, it's saying, I'm here for you, I'm approachable, come talk to me. The fourth, reasons why emotion, the fourth reason why emotions matter is because they drive our physical and mental health. So in our work with teachers, here's what we found. The culture of their school was driving their negative emotions, which in turn was influencing their physical health, like their body mass index, their body fat, their sleep habits, their sleep troubles, um, their anxiety and depression. And finally, what we know is that emotions are the drivers of our performance and creativity. We'll get into more of that. But before we go into the skills, I wanted us to pause for a moment and just ask yourself, you know, how open are you to talking about feelings? How open are you to sharing feelings, to asking people about how they're feeling. Won't people tell you how they feel? Do you wanna listen? 
or do you kind of shy away from being that active listener? When you don't regulate very well, do you say this is, this is, this is just who I am? Or do you say, wow, I got to really work at being better at dealing with my stress and anxiety? I call those two people the emotion scientist and the emotion judge. The scientist is accepting of all emotions. The judge is more critical. Think about it. The emotion scientist you know, is in learner mode. The emotion judge is in knower mode. Like, why are you so angry? Or don't be this way. Do you have a growth mindset around learning this? Or do you have a more fixed mindset around dealing with your feelings? And that leads to the skills of emotional intelligence. There are five, and we call them the ruler skills. The first is recognizing emotions. So this has to do with our ability to identify both how we feel ourselves, but also how we can interpret how other people are feeling through facial expressions, body language, vocal tone, behavior. The second is understanding the causes of our feelings. I think right now, in particular with our colleagues and with our uh, kids and our partners, we, we wanna get granular. We wanna understand you know, what's going on in their brains. What are the stories that they're telling themselves around what's happening? Because that's gonna help us label those feelings properly. Is it stress or is it overwhelmed or is it anxiety or is it feeling too much pressure? These are all different feelings. Even for myself, sometimes I'm stressed out and it's really I'm overwhelmed and I need to take things off my plate. Whereas more recently, you know, with the coronavirus situation, it's really just anxiety, right? It's this anxiety around the uncertainty. It's different from being overwhelmed, which means that the way we would express it and the way we would help our children or our colleagues or our loved ones regulate would be very different. Because think about it, the strategies to deal with being overwhelmed typically are about taking things off your plate, giving yourself more space. But dealing with constant rumination around the future, as we, many of us are feeling right now, this anxiety, this chronic stress, the strategies would be different. A lot of times we have to focus on shifting the way we're talking to ourselves. So that leads me to the real crux of my presentation, which is going to be about healthy emotion regulation. Everyone just take a minute and pause. Maybe take an inhale, check your posture. Maybe try to get more focused and just read this slide. Healthy emotion regulation. The thoughts and actions we use to prevent unwanted emotions to reduce the difficult ones, to initiate feelings. Maybe you just wanna throw some joy into that dinner time conversation or take that walk to maintain emotions, to enhance them. In the service of having greater well-being, building good relationships, making sound decisions and attaining goals. There are many forms of healthy emotion regulation, right? There's the self-control and self-regulation mark Get up and go exercise. Don't lie to yourself that you feel better about yourself staying in bed. Um, there's co-regulation, which is what we do with our loved ones or our colleagues and friends, where we're going back and forth to support their well-being. And then there's what we call interpersonal regulation, which are like, do you know what's going to help your kid or your partner have more pleasant emotions or what's going to help them feel less anxious and stressed? And do you support them with those strategies? Do you give them the gift of healthy emotion regulation. Right now, we know that most of us are feeling stress. At least that's what the research showed. Our brains, when we feel that way, are saying things, this is unpredictable, this is uncontrollable, and it feels like it's gonna last forever. Um, and currently our research shows that that's the way people are feeling. And we know that when we have that kind of emotion, when it's in its intensity, coupled with what we call resource depletion, not enough nutrition, not enough sleep, not enough exercise. What happens, our worst selves comes out, right? Spraying people, gargling with clocks. I went shopping last night again, no toilet paper in the biggest uh, supermarket here in Connecticut. Saying mean or hurtful things to our partners, catastrophic thinking. I like to think about this in other contexts. So turbulence, 
Um, I do a lot of flying and I'm a somewhat anxious flyer. You know, um, it's raining or it's cloudy and a little turbulence. I'm always like, this is going to be the time when the plane crashes. That was based on no information. Then I interviewed my cousin who's a pilot for an airline and I said, hey, Rich, like, what's the story with turbulence? And he's like, you know, Mark, there's never been a plane crash because of turbulence. It's like, well, now I have information. So I was making up a story around all this, like the plane's gonna go down because of turbulence, when in fact, like it's a zero chance at this point, right, from research. So now I have an opportunity to tell myself a different story when I'm flying, when there's turbulence. That's the power of emotion regulation or teaching it and practicing it. I don't have time to go into all the strategies. Recently, I've done um, some talks and free webinars on this process. Um, where I cover them in more greater detail. Um, but right now I'm just gonna share with you the, what we call the big seven. The first is physiological regulation. Are we managing our nervous systems? Are we taking that breath to deactivate? How about we try that right now? How about we all just pause, take a breath? <sighs> Feels good to just breathe a little bit. The critical thing that you need to know about physiological regulation is that when we are highly activated, it's very hard to use the cognitive strategies because our brains start lying to us in terms of going to that survival mode as opposed to planning and solution focused mode. The second thing is self-care, right? Especially during times like this, we wanna have a strong immune system, which means you gotta get enough sleep. You gotta try not to eat unhealthy foods. I know it's hard, I've been eating a lot more. I was like baking pies last week. I, don't, I never made a pie in my life. I'm like making even a pear pie. I'm like, what am I doing with myself? Um, but it was fun. Uh, exercise, right? It's amazing. I've been getting up later now that I don't have to be at work at a certain time. And then I'm, you know, I used to work out in the mornings and I'm like, well, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to restore. Again, it was my brain lying to me because we know that exercise helps induce endorphins helps us to feel more pleasant throughout the day. Third, healthy relationships. All of us have a basic need to be seen, to be heard, and to have our needs met. So it's an opportunity to check in. Am I getting that for myself, and am I giving that to the people who I love and support? Fourth, we gotta manage our thoughts. It's so easy to go into catastrophic thinking, to ruminate, to have a negative self-talk. Think about it, we're programmed from early in our lives to have negative self-views. I'm too dark, I'm too light, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too short, my nose is too big, my nose is too short, I'm too feminine, I'm too masculine, I'm too gay, I'm too straight. It's endless how much negative thinking all of us have been programmed to have. How much time have we spent supporting our children, supporting the parents of children in both being role models for their kids, but also teaching their kids these helpful ways of thinking as opposed to programming them to have these negative thoughts. The fifth is about managing your life smartly. I'll give you the example there. First week when all of us were closed down here in New Haven, I was sitting at home, I was getting up late, I was sitting in my kitchen table watching CNN by the refrigerator, I gained four pounds, I was having so many nightmares about what was happening because I was information overload and it was, I had no routine. I just didn't have um, a setup to be success. So the question I ask you now is, are you set up for success during these times? Can you figure out, can you be prevention focused and think about what you need in order to have that routine to create the predictability? Because when we're thinking about all the unpredictable things, that's when our brain goes into that kind of catastrophic thinking. When we set that routine for ourselves by getting up a certain time, putting in that exercise if we can, doing our work if we're working. And, you know, I was in a webinar just before this and somebody said, I'm a, a janitor, um, I am a cafeteria worker, I'm a teacher, I'm a parent, like I got 40 roles. And they said, well, you can say that to yourself all day long and drive yourself nuts or you can reframe it and say, wow, I'm really talented. 
look at that. Look at all I'm capable of doing to support my children and my life. It's a very different way. The experience is the same, but our perception of it can shift. You got to do things you enjoy, right? Doing, taking a walk doesn't cost anything. Um, playing a game at home doesn't cost anything, right? Try to do things that are meaningful. Oftentimes our best ideas come out when we're just having fun and relaxing. And finally, I will tell you that you will fail. Um, I will share with you that I have been an emotional basket case for the last uh, couple of weeks. I'm not used to being at home. I'm used to being at work early in the morning. I travel about 50% of the time. And, uh, and now, this is the longest time I've been with my family. Uh, it's been about a month now. And um, I, I said, I'm gonna cook. That's gonna be my strategy. And then I would make these meals and then I got unsolicited feedback. You know, why'd you put corn in that? I think it would have been better without the corn. I'm like, well, I think you should be grateful that I made you the freaking dinner. And then it's, you know, as you can imagine, happens and then you say things and then you yeah you know, I hope I'm not alone here and so the question is do I have the courage to just say you know what I apologize um, can we move on uh, and also I was thinking to myself you know this is an opportunity to teach my family about the power of forgiveness so I want to wrap up my time with everyone the next like, seven or so minutes just really focusing on the thought piece because I think it's something that we have control over and that we can all work on. You should know that about 40% of your well-being has to do with your outlook on life. As I said earlier, our negative self-talk often starts early, defined by others. But you can change that conversation you have with yourself in your head. It takes time, you may feel uncomfortable, um, and you can't just tell someone, don't think that way, right? Stop that. That doesn't work. So the two strategies that we support are what we call positive self-talk and positive reappraisal. Positive self-talk is saying encouraging words to yourself. So, you know, instead of saying, I'm going to lose it, which is the way I felt a lot of the time over the last few weeks, maybe, just maybe you say something like I said to myself, Mark, you're a professor of emotional intelligence. You can get through this. Oh, that's true. I do know these strategies, except to use them. Maybe, you know, looking at the situation through a different lens. So our Center for Emotional Intelligence has 65 full-time employees, all of whom are, I don't know where they are. And um, I, I sometimes wake up like, this is never going to work and everybody's going to be distracted and everyone's not going to get any work done. And then I say, well, maybe, you know, Mark, I mean, think of this as an opportunity um, to empower your team to be more independent. That's the power of shifting our thinking. The last few things I want to share with you are what I might call managing our life smartly. Think about even our situation. Um, we as Americans, broadly speaking, of course, none of you on this webinar, we are, we're programmed to be interventionists, right? We'd like to spend money um, to maintain people in a prison setting as opposed to educating people early in life. Um, we want to spend billions of trillions of dollars giving people, you know, stimulus packages instead of being forward thinking and saying, wow, we need to snap, we need to get this thing taken care of months in advance. And I think we do the same thing, you know, with our health and well-being. So one way to be a preventionist um, is to take a moment and think about the self that you'd like to be for your loved ones and for your colleagues and for your children. So we're gonna pause there. I'm gonna ask you to think about your best self right now. How do you wanna be seen? How do you wanna be talked about? How do you wanna be experienced? And what are the words that come up for you? What are the adjectives that you would use to describe your best possible self? And when you're feeling that anxiety or that stress or the anger or the irritation, can you pause? And before you enter into the situation with your colleague or with your boss or with your child or loved one, can you just 
activate that best self and try to operate through that lens. And what we know from research is that by doing so, you'll be kinder, you'll be more compassionate, um, you'll feel better about yourself. So some final tips. Try to surround yourself with people who, um, don't surround yourself, I should say, with people who make you anxious. You know, do try to su surround yourself with people who are calming. Um, don't enter a meeting when you're anxious or irritated, right? Do try to activate your best self in advance so you're prepared. And lastly, give yourself the permission to be free, right? Creativity comes in a downtime. Do things you enjoy. All of these things are just a few ideas to just give you that permission to breathe, you know, take a walk, try My colleague Robin says, you know, she and her husband are um, uh, singing a new song every time they make the bed in the morning. Have fun with it. Think about the person who inspired you in life, who gave you the permission to feel. I always say, talk about my uncle, who was that compassionate emotion scientist who really helped me get through my childhood. He's no longer with me, but you know, I think often that I have a niece, his daughter, I call her my niece. You know, what am I doing to support her? How am I helping her get through this? What, how can I be her, Uncle Marvin? Watch a new show. Just connect with fun, friends in a fun way. Lastly, so I put this all together for you. One, can you please give yourself and others the permission to feel all emotions? Don't be that judge. There's no such thing as a bad feeling. Know that emotion regulation isn't about not feeling, right? It's about accepting all of our feelings wisely. Can you strive to be that scientist and not that judge? Remember, physical distance does not mean psychological distance. So be that Uncle Marvin for someone through a phone call, through a Skype meeting, through a Zoom meeting. Appreciate that developing these skills can be harder than developing the traditional skills. You know, five plus five equals 10, we got that. This is pretty much life's work. I don't think any of us could have been prepared for the fragility that we're experiencing right now as a nation. I know that I wasn't prepared for this and I spend my life thinking about and researching this. I am being tested every day in terms of my skills at dealing with my feelings. And I just say, you know, Mark, embrace the complexity, you'll get through this. And can you be that role model? If you fail, be open to apologizing, forgiving, and maybe even seeking help if you need it. And lastly, what I wanna say is, don't give up on yourselves, don't give up on the people you love, and even the people you don't love. Don't give up on anybody. And you know, think about it as our moral obligation to support people through this. And think about it in terms of your health, right? And your children's health, depending on it. And on that note, I wanted to say thank you to ASU GSV for inviting me to share some of these ideas. Hope they're helpful. Um, and I'll end with a quote by Viktor Frankl, one of my heroes in life. What Viktor wrote, in a concentration camp, between stimulus and response, there is space. And that space is our power to choose our response. And our response <laughs> lies our growth and freedom. So everyone on the column on the left, you can see my contact information. There's a website to just get free resources or to read more about our center's work. Uh, OG Life Lab is our business solutions for teaching emotional intelligence and ruleapproach.org is our center's work for schools. And on that note, just wanna ask everyone to take maybe an inhale and an exhale. Can you remember those adjectives that you came up with to describe your best self? And can you just try your best to be that best self today and for the days moving forward? And when you fail, again, forgive yourself, take another breath and start again. Thank you, everybody. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, I think we all needed that, so really thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Um, we've recorded the sessions and we will be sending those out. Um, we're also gonna be back next Wednesday um, and we'll be sending out the agenda for next Wednesday in the coming days. 
Um, thank you again, everyone, and be safe.